This is Connie Francis, one of the top female recording artists of all time. Connie Francis was born Conchetta Rosemaria Franconero on December the 12th, 1937, in New York, New Jersey. Her parents were George and Ida Franconero. George was a roofing contractor, and the Franconeros lived in the Italian Jewish neighborhood of Newark. Connie learned to speak Yiddish and Hebrew at an early age and recorded many of her songs in Hebrew after becoming famous. For the first three years, her father had little to do with his daughter, but at the age of three, he found that they had something in common, their love for music. He asked if she wanted to take piano lessons or accordion lessons. Connie said, my first mistake, I said accordion. George Franconera became the perfect stage mother, encouraging his daughter to play the accordion and sing at all neighborhood festivals. On September the 25th, 1940, Connie's younger brother, George Franconera Jr. was born. He had little interest in music and performing. Therefore, he received less attention from his father. And by the age of four, Connie was performing for veterans at the New Jersey Veterans Hospital. From an early age, she will form a bond with veterans. Years later, performing for the troops in Vietnam and never missing an opportunity to support veterans' activities. Also at age four in 1941, she performed at the Olympic Amusement Park in Irvington, New Jersey, playing the accordion and singing Anchors Away and Solo Mia in Italian. In 1951, she attended Newark Art High School, and in 1953, the family moved to Belleville, New Jersey. Connie attended Belleville High School and graduated in 1955 at the top of her class. While still in high school, Connie and her father went to the office of George Sheck, who was hosting a weekly NBC children's variety show that was called Star Time Kids. Mr. Sheck said that he had enough kids that could sing. And as they were leaving, Connie's father turned around and said, oh yes, she also plays the accordion. Sheck said, wait a minute, that's different. Connie will appear on Star Time Kids once a week through most of high school. While appearing on Star Time, she got an opportunity to perform on the Arthur Godfrey Children's Christmas Talent Special. And by this time, George Sheck, who was now Connie's manager, had told her to ditch the accordion, which she was happy to do. Arthur Godfrey was having trouble pronouncing Connie's last name and suggested that she call herself Connie Francis instead of Connie Franconero. By now, Connie was making demo records for songwriters that wanted to push their songs to well-established artists. Connie was still in school at this time, and her father, being a strict Italian father, didn't allow his daughter to date. Now, George Sheck and Connie's father went to every record company that they could find trying to get a contract for Francis. However, nothing seemed to work. Every label turned them down. And finally, when they approached MGM with a record called Freddy that Connie had recorded, they signed her to a record contract in 1955 because the executive at MGM had a son named Freddy and was having a birthday and he liked the song. During 1956, George Sheck was not only managing and trying to help Connie, he was also managing a young singer and songwriter by the name of Bobby Darren. Both Connie and Bobby were yet to have a hit record. Bobby began writing songs for the 19-year-old Connie Francis. Although it was a rocky start to begin with between the two, they soon fell in love. And when Connie's father got wind of the romance, he began plotting to keep the two apart. When they were apart, 
they wrote letters to one another. It was discovered years later after Bobby Darren's early death from heart trouble at the age of 37 that he had kept the letters that Connie had written to him. They were so serious about their feelings for each other that Bobby tried to get Connie to elope with him. She said years later, not marrying Bobby Darren was her life's biggest regret. She should have listened to her heart instead of to her father, who was so stern, he once even chased Bobby away with a pistol, threatened to kill him if he seen him around his daughter again. During this time, Connie was under contract to MGM, and MGM gave Connie every opportunity they could to record a successful record. Around this time, George Franconero was contacted by two mobsters. They told him that they controlled thousands of jukeboxes along the East Coast, and they could place Connie's record on every one of them. If Mr. Franconero accepted their offer, he knew that he would lose control of Connie's career. So he said, no thanks, we'll make it on our own. Many New Jersey families in those days, especially unions and building contractors, were approached by mobsters, whether they wanted to be or not. The Franconero family was no exception. After several record releases, without much success, MGM decided to release Connie from her contract. They had one more recording session scheduled before the end of the contract. Her father had been trying for a year to get her to record an old standard written way back in 1923 called Who's Sorry Now? Connie didn't like the song and neither did MGM. But at the end of the session with 16 minutes left, Connie decided to record Who's Sorry Now so her father wouldn't be mad at her when she got home that afternoon. Three months went by and nothing. In November of 1957, national host of American Bandstand, Dick Clark, found a record that laid on his desk for several weeks. He liked the song and he liked the voice. On New Year's Day, 1958, Connie Francis was at home with her family, celebrating the New Year. Her brother George Jr. was watching American Bandstand as they usually did. When Dick Clark announced a new song, Who's Sorry Now, by a newcomer named Connie Francis. It was a total surprise. Connie was shocked and ran to tell her father, who didn't believe it. Within five weeks, Who's Sorry Now sold one million copies, and Connie Francis was singing on American Bandstand. For this opportunity, she was eternally grateful to Dick Clark, and they became lifelong friends. After her first hit, the next thing is to find the right follow-up song. Connie was having a hard time. Two had already bombed, so she was becoming desperate. Two up-and-coming songwriters by the name of Howie Greenfield and Neil Sadaka began pitching their songs to Connie. None appealed to her. Too slow or just not right? After 93 songs, they brought out, finally, a crazy song that they had thought was not right for her and told her so. But she loved it. Stupid Cupid, she told them, is my next hit song. And she was right. The next year, 1959, Connie Francis will have a double-sided hit. Now, usually record companies would place a not-so-good song on the backside of one that they th wanted to push. They would indicate to the disc jockeys to push the A side. However, in this case, Connie's record turned out to have two A sides with lipstick on your collar and Frankie achieving two gold records. Also released in 1959 was My Happiness and Among My Souvenirs. In 1960, she will co-star in her first movie, Where the Boys Are, with George Hamilton. She will also sing the title song. And that year, 
Connie will record Everybody Somebody's Fool. It became a number one hit. Connie stated that one of the highlights of her career was her singing Never on Sunday at the 1961 Academy Awards. She will become a top nightclub draw. And in 1963, she will appear in another movie, Follow the Boys, with Paula Prentice. Throughout the next several years, Connie Francis will have 16 top 10 hits. For four years, she'll be voted the best female vocalist of American Bandstand by their viewers. The next year, 1964, Connie will star with Jim Hutton in her third movie, Looking for Love. Also in 64, on August the 15th, Connie Francis marries Dick Canlis, who was a press agent and entertainment director at the Aladdin Hotel. The couple met in 1963 and dated for almost a year, but unfortunately, the marriage only lasted three months. The couple divorced on November the 15th, 1964. When asked why she got married, 26-year-old Connie stated, I wanted to have sex. In 1965, Connie starred in her last movie, When the Boys Meet the Girls. Connie didn't care very much for the movie business, and she said so. She never felt comfortable with it, and she liked the first movie, Where the Boys Are, but she didn't care much for the other three. In 1967, Connie was voted Best Female Singer in Las Vegas. One of the most memorable moments she said of her career was when she sang God Bless America to the troops in Vietnam in 1968. With tears in their eyes, the entire army of soldiers stood and sang with her. On the 16th of January, 1971, Connie marries Isie Marin. It was a second marriage for both. Marin was a well-known hairstylist in Las Vegas. They married in the Catholic Church and also had a civil ceremony. Connie stated that she gave up her career trying to make a home for Isie's two children from a previous marriage. There was a clash of personalities and Connie moved back to her parents' home and the couple divorced after one year on February the 14th, 1972. A year and a half after her divorce from Izzy, Connie marries Joseph Garzella on 16 September, 1973. Three months later, she will learn that her first love, Bobby Darren, has passed away during heart surgery at the age of 37. Garzilla was a restaurant and travel agency owner. Connie said later that her husband made millions from his travel agency and that she had bankrolled. During their marriage, Joseph encouraged Connie to continue her singing career. While on a comeback tour on 8th of November, 1974, while performing at the Westbury Music Fair in Westbury, New York, at the first stop of her national tour, after her performance, Connie was staying at the Howard Johnson Motel Lodge in Jericho, New York. Her husband was out of town on business, but he had left her to be looked after by her secretary and her secretary's husband. Her room was on the second floor, and their room was a few rooms down from hers. They asked if she wanted them to move closer, and she said no, she'd be okay. Connie locked the sliding doors to her room and went to bed sometime around 2.30 a.m. Three hours later, she was awakened by a young man standing over her bed with a knife. It was discovered that by jiggling the sliding doors, they would come open. Later, it was found out that other rooms had also been broken into. He held a knife to her throat and threatened to kill her if she screamed or made a sound. After the assault, she was tied to a chair, naked, with her hands tied behind her back. The chair was then turned over in a mattress thrown on top. It's believed the assassin had intended to kill her. He didn't know who she was, but after finding out that she might be famous, 
thought that the police might try harder to find him. He leaves with her jewelry and a mink coat. She had actually talked him into sparing her life. Cunny tried for almost a half an hour working her way to the telephone. She was taken to the county medical center and she had been beaten and in shock. Connie retreated to her home, located at 58 Holton Lane, Essex Fells, New Jersey. She will seldom leave her house and will retreat to her bedroom for months at a time. A few months before the attack, she and Joseph had filed to adopt a baby. Two months after the attack, the adoption came through and they were presented with a baby boy that they named Joseph Garzilla Jr. The baby will become Connie's entire world, but she will still not be able to face the public. Two years later, in 1976, she will file suit against Howard Johnson and Company. Connie will be on the stand for six days, reliving the attack. A police officer testifies that the room was easy to get into by jiggling a door. He also testified that rooms had been broken in four times and that the motel had done absolutely nothing to secure the doors. She was awarded two and a half million, which she spent the biggest part on organizations to help rape victims. In 1977, Connie had nasal surgery, hoping to correct an allergy problem caused by sleeping in an air conditioner room. It took three surgeries to correct the problem. However, the unthinkable happened. Connie Francis lost her voice and couldn't sing. She's told that she may never sing again. Her depression is so deep, she tries to overdose on pills and is found by the housekeeper the next morning. She is still not able to be intimate with her husband, even though four years had passed since the attack. On the 1st of October, 1978, Connie Francis and her third husband, Joseph Garzilla, divorced. On March 6, 1981, seven years after the attack at the Howard Johnson and four years after she was told that she would never sing again, her 40-year-old younger brother, George Franconero Jr., whom she was very close to, stepped out of his home located at 5 Cypress Avenue, North Caldwell, New Jersey, while scraping ice off the windshield of his car in his driveway, two mobsters from behind a hedge shot and killed him. Later, while appearing on the Larry King show, Connie said that two mobsters were never caught. She told Larry King that her brother had become an informant for the government against the mob. This was their reprisal. He had refused government protection. And no, she didn't know who the two gunmen were. They were from out of town, she said. But she did know who was behind it. King asked if she would reveal his name. She said, no, do you want to find me face down in the river? Once while appearing in Las Vegas, Comedian Don Rickles, while on stage, began making fun of a couple that was sitting in the audience. It was a part of his act. He would pick people out at random. He would say such things as, Where did you come up with her at? Sonny Liston has better looking legs than she does. And uh, you should have kept the one you had here last night. Rickles, not knowing that he was making fun of a mobster's wife, went to Connie Francis for help. He was scared and said that he had received word that they were going to break his legs. He wanted Connie to make a call to her friends. She did, and Rickles was eternally grateful. This is a photo of Connie when she sang at Victoria Gotti's wedding, the daughter of mobster John Gotti. The mafia boss is standing on the left. Eight months after the murder of her brother, George Jr., Connie Francis had not performed before a public for seven years. As suddenly as she had lost her voice, she regained it. 
While walking down the street, she began to realize that she was singing. And for the first time in four years, it sounded like her. She ran to her car and began playing her songs and singing along. Exciting, she called her father and then her manager and said, book me somewhere, I want to sing again. She was booked of all places back in Westbury, New York, the same town where her last performance was made. The crowd loved her. She received five standing ovations. Two years after her triumph's return, in August of 1983, Connie's father had his daughter committed to a psychiatric hospital in Dallas, Texas. She was released after four days evaluation. Two months later in October, he had her committed again in a mental hospital in Florida. Again, she was quickly released. Connie was diagnosed as a manic depressant. Her career would be placed on hold for the next four years. She'll be in and out of hospitals 17 times. Even her close friend, Dick Clark, will have to have her committed for observation. He said it was one of the hardest things that he had ever done. During this turbulent period in her life, she managed to keep her sense of humor and to accomplish quite a bit. In 1984, she wrote and published her autobiography, Who's Sorry Now? It became a number one New York Times bestseller. A year later in 1985, Connie marries for the fourth time. She married Bob Parkinson, a TV producer. The marriage lasts eight months. Four years later in 1989, the doctors finally discovered the right combination of medicine for her depression. However, for years she suffered at the hands of doctors and institutions with the wrong diagnosis and gave her medication that caused depression and suicidal thoughts that they were trying to cure. Connie continued to perform, but at a slower pace. In December 2000, she headlined in Las Vegas for the first time since 1989. In 2007, she performed to sold-out crowds at the Castro Theater in San Francisco. In 2010, she appeared at the Las Vegas Hilton in a show called The Grand Divas of Stage. In 2017, Connie Francis released her second autobiography, giving full disclosure to her amazing life, Among My Souvenirs. <laughs>